I think you guys probably know that our midterm exam is tomorrow. Where is that? So we're today, and midterm is tomorrow night. Please be there. <laughs> um, our usual sections are canceled this week, although some section leaders are hosting reviews with their own uh, students. Uh, yeah, question. Uh, a few days ago, you said like, you would give a hint for us for coming to class. Yeah, yeah. He, he asked a question that is probably on many people's mind. He said, <laughs> you told me if I came to class, you were going to give me something, right? <laughs> I remember that. I remember that. But I tell you what, every day there's people who stand in the back and after about 30 seconds they leave because they're waiting for that. So I'm going to give it to you in about 15, 20 minutes, okay? <laughs> so if you're here for that, you've got to stick around a little bit. And if it's about halfway through and I haven't given you that yet, then just like shake at me, wave at me, and be like, hey, <laughs> remember what you said? <laughs> I will give you that. I will. I appreciate that you're here. So it's not just animal pictures uh, when you come to my class. <laughs> I promise. So look, exams tomorrow night. I know you guys are focused on that. You're stressed about that. There's lots of good questions going up on the piazza, asking about midterm and practice problems. And the section leaders and I, are we try our best to uh, answer those, you know, get on to those as quick as we can. Um, Lair is open tonight if you have questions about things. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the exam today, although, I mean, I think in general, you guys have had the study topic list for a while to look at, the practice exams to look at. So uh, this lecture is not fully a midterm review, but I'll talk a little bit about midterm stuff. Um, I'm also going to cover a little bit of new material today, but I know you don't, won't care at all about that because it's not what you're focused on right now. So don't worry, the new stuff I cover today is not on the midterm. Um, the fact that I cover anything new at all today is based on a couple of reasons. I mean, one is that, look, if you're in a quarter system, you just don't have that many lectures. So you can't just throw them away. I have to always keep moving. I have to keep covering new stuff to get done all the stuff I need to teach you. Um, and also, we have a holiday next Monday, so we don't get as many lectures, this unit of material, to cover everything. And also, I know how you people are. If there's a Monday holiday, you're probably going to ditch me on Friday, too. Because you took a test Thursday night, you won't show up on Friday. So I feel like I'm going to miss a lot of you for a while. So I still have to cover a little bit of stuff today. Um, anyway, that's kind of where we're at. Um, that's what we'll do today. And we will still have lecture on Friday if anything's left of you after the <laughs> exam tomorrow night. Um, OK, so what I want to do first, the first thing I want to do today is there have been several questions and office hours and uh, GASA and stuff about the topic called Big O. And I want to refresh, review a little bit more on that topic because I, th I thought it might be helpful. And um, as a little tip, <coughs> so anyway, uh, <laughs> see, I got you. Um, it's not the last tip. There's going to be one other tip. Um, I want to talk about this big O topic. I didn't cover it very much. I didn't have a lot of lecture time to go into detail on it. Which, so it makes sense that it's confusing. So I'm going to go all the way back to, this is lecture slides five, which came from week two. So I want to talk about this idea of big O. The general idea here is that individual statements of code, you could pretend that they each take one unit of time to execute. So then if you execute a for loop that goes 10 repetitions, maybe we'd say that loop execute 10 statements. Or if the for loop body has five commands in it and it repeats 10 times, maybe the for loop executes 10 times 5 equals 50 statements. So let's pretend that there's kind of this fundamental atomic one unit of execution time that a statement needs in order to run. Now that's not correct. That's not true. Different statements take different amount of time. But it's a good approximation to start from. If you want to fold all the complexity of real life into this, it gets too complicated very quickly. So let's pretend every statement takes one unit of time to run. Let's pretend that if you call a function and the function has n statements in it, then the function call takes n amount of time, right? So you know, even though a function call is one statement, if the function call has a giant for loop in it, then the cost of calling the function is not one. It's all that repetitions of the code inside of the function, right? So uh, that's, that's sort of the cost of calling a function in our little world that we're living in. And as I say, a loop is sort of repetitions done times the number of things in there. So for example, if there's a function with five statements in it, and I write a for loop that 10 times calls that function, it takes about 50 statements. Do you understand? So things like this. This is kind of the model we live in. If you have an if-else statement, 
then if it goes in the if, it does the number of statements in the if. And if it goes in the else, it does the number of statements in the else. It only does the one that it actually executes. So this is kind of our like sloppy model of code execution. And so look, on the test, I might give you a question where you might have to do stuff like this, right? What's the runtime of this? And so a lot of these questions, I'll have a variable named n, and I don't tell you what its value is. It's some number, it's some integer. And the idea would be basically, how many statements roughly does this do relative to n? It's a variable, right? So, you know, if you have nested loops that repeat n times, that's sort of n times n times the body. So if the body has one statement, it's n times n times one. If the body has four statements, it's n times n times four. It's four n squared. So that's kind of the general way that these, these types of uh, things are shown. Now, these are very artificial pieces of code, but I, what I'm really trying to do is get you to be able to look at your code and say, oh, I'm looping over my vector, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing that. Oh, that's going to take about this many statements to execute. I want you to have a general instinct for this kind of stuff. Okay? Now, the thing we learn about when we talk about big O is that a lot of times runtime only matters if you're dealing with a large set of data. Your algorithm can be kind of sloppy or inefficient if you're only processing 10 students or 10 records of a database or something like that. But if you're processing 1,000, a million, a billion, it starts to matter more whether you're wasting time on each record, each student, each pair of students, whatever. So we talk about how an algorithm's runtime grows. That's what we're more concerned with. You know, you can measure the runtime of anything. You can run a piece of code and start a stopwatch and then stop a stopwatch and you can say that it took five seconds or something like that, right? But that's very flawed because my computer might be a different speed than your computer. Maybe we buy more processing power, more RAM. The algorithm takes less time. So let's see. So it isn't really about what absolute amount of time a per piece of code took for a given person in a given day. It's more about, well, relative to the time it just took, if I make the input size bigger, how much more time will it take? How fast does the runtime of the algorithm grow as the input you feed it grows? What is the proportion between those two things? That's, what's, that's what computer scientists think is most interesting to talk about when it comes to runtime of code, OK? So we talk about it as the growth rate or the complexity of an algorithm. And what, what computer scientists have decided is that you don't need to get too picky about little values and little details. You should just focus on what sort of power of the input size the runtime is proportional to. So um, you know, if your algorithm takes 0.4n plus n to the third plus whatever uh, statements to run, what you find is that as n gets really big, that into the third component of that expression is the part that really matters the most. Because if n is 1,000, then n to the third is, what, a billion or something. And so those billions completely dwarf any millions or thousands in the lesser powers of n in that expression, you see? So like, what we've decided as a, as a group, as computer scientists, is we will just simplify these things heavily to make it easier to talk about by throwing away all the powers that are lower and throwing away any little constants, any little multiples or times or pluses in there. So we'll just throw all that down and say it's about n to the third. And sure, 0.4 n to the third is different than n to the third. Those are different. If you took a 0.4 algorithm and a 1 algorithm that are proportional n to the third and you ran them both, they'll take a different amount of time to run. But again, growth. The growth is what we care about. So, okay, that's how we talk about runtime. We would say an algorithm that took that many statements takes on the order of or about n to the third statements to run. And we say order of n to the third, our shorthand notation for that is we say O of n to the third, order of n to the third. So we call it big O, right? So that's what this is really about. That's the point of it. Now, in terms of you guys, the reason I want to cover this with you is because, you know, we care about efficiency. We care about good algorithms. Mostly, you guys are doing a lot of code that uses collections. Okay? And that collection code, if you use the collection in the wrong way or you choose the wrong collection to solve a given problem, it can really slow down your program. Some of you have seen some of this when you've written some of your homework assignments as well. And so I really just want you to have that. That's the ultimate goal here is a good intuition about how to craft an algorithm. Um, okay, so like certain methods and functions of these different collections have sort of a runtime big O that they require in order to execute. And you know, we talk about things that take a constant amount of time like Adding something to the end of a vector takes a constant amount of time because you don't have to shift anything around. You just put it at the end. It's, it's fast. Asking for a value, getting a value, or setting the value at a given index, that is also fast. So we say that takes a constant amount of time. We say it basically takes one unit of time. We go of one. But any operation that might have to 
loop a lot, shift a lot of values around, we say that it takes n time because it's proportional to the size of the vector, n. If you insert a value at the front of a vector, it takes n time to shift all the elements over, all of the n elements over. So now in this case, you know, in the, I think in my previous slide I had this variable called n that was an int or something. And now my size of my vector is n for this purpose. n is like this, the amount of things you're processing or something. Now what a lot of students get confused about is, well, okay, if you insert at the front of the vector, it shifts, it takes n time. Okay, fine, I get it. But what if you insert like in the middle of the vector? How long does that take? What do you think? What do you say? Yeah. I think it would still be n because um, you would just have a coefficient in front of n, but we don't we draw the coefficient. <laughs> yeah, what you said is right. I'll repeat. I'm rephrasing. You, you said it's basically still re relative to n. It's basically about half of n because if it's in the middle, it has to shift about half of the n elements over. But we would still say that half of n is on the order of n. The reason being because if you double n, you double what half of n equals also. So if, if, I, if I change the input size, what will be the change in the runtime? If those are the same as each other, then it's linearly proportional to n. Even if it were 1% of n, as long as n is part of that expression, it's proportional to n because of its growth. So don't overthink too much about is it in the middle, is it at the very end, whatever. The one exception would be if you happen to insert it at the very, very end or like one or two elements away from the very, very end or something like that then it only has to shift one or two things. It doesn't have to shift anything really. So, you know, on the sheet that I give you on your, on your midterm study sheet, it has these big O uh, listings for all these methods. And under insert and remove, it says big O of N. But there is a notable exception. If you happen to be processing the very end of the list, that is actually big O of one because it doesn't really have to shift anybody over. Okay, so you have to watch out for that a little bit, right? Anyway, look, what this really comes down to is you have to answer questions where I show you code and I say, what's the big O of this code? So you have to start out by knowing the big O of collection methods, and you have to start out by knowing these rules for, like, if you have a loop, if you have a function call, what does that do? And if you combine all that, you should be able to intuit the runtime of different things. So um, I'll skip this slide. But, I mean, the point of this slide is the worse the big O is, the algorithm takes really, really, really long, and you don't want that. Um, <clears throat> So here's some examples of code that, that involve big O. This is the sort of stuff I might ask you to do on the midterm tomorrow. And <clears throat> so like this number one, I do a loop that goes n times and I call add. What's the big O of calling add a single time? One. If I do it in a loop n times, what's the big O of that? N. So that first for loop is big O of n, the first for loop. Second for loop, I repeat n times, I call remove, and I call size. What's the big O of remove? It's n in general. I'm removing the last element. What's the big O of that? And I'm repeating that n times. So what's the big O of the second for loop? If I do a for loop that's n, and then I do another for loop that's n, what's the overall big O of the whole piece of code? So this is where some people get tripped up. You see two for loops. A lot of people say, oh, two for loops, that's n times n, it's n squared. You, you don't multiply unless there's a nest name. If you have an n loop and inside of that you have another n loop or n operation, then it's n times n. But if you have one followed by another, it's n plus n. Because you just like merge, just think about it, you just do this and then do that. It's the total time of them both. It's actually two n, it's not n times n. So that first chunk is still the slice line there is basically two n or so uh, ish. Therefore, it is big O n. So the answer is B for that first chunk of code. Yes? So in the first for loop, you had done it n squared times. And then in the second for loop, you had done it B1 dot size times. Would that still be n squared, or would it be n? Yeah, good question. So sometimes I'll use an expression that doesn't directly say n, but you should be able to tell that it has something to do with n. So you said, if I loop up to B dot size instead of up to n, what will that do? Well, if b.size dot size is n, then that's a loop that's going n times, right? But um, if my first for loop, you, you had a separate comment, which you said, if the first for loop goes from 0 to n times n, then that means that loop is repeating n squared times. So that, that size of that collection is n squared. So that means the, the, that first for loop would be big O of n squared, right? So again, the intuition would be, if I sort of double the value of n, what would happen to the runtime? I think it would. Uh, quadruple if the loop bound over n times n. So that would be a squared relation. Yes, in fact. Oh, that's a really 
actually interesting question. You said, what about recursion? What if I have a recursive function that does big O of n, and then I make n calls of it? Um, since big O is harder to reason about with recursion, I promise I will not ask you anything about big O in recursive form. Um, turns out that's tricky enough that you have to go learn about that in a whole different theory class called a recurrence relation. You learn how to reason about recursive code runtimes that way. Um, I won't ask you that, but I mean, the general answer is if you have n function calls and each one of those n work, that would be n squared. So recursion, you can do big O stuff with recursion if you need to. Uh, question, yeah. So you had said that removing an element anywhere from, from somewhere in the middle of, um, from somewhere in the middle of the vector would be n, um, but this one is only one because it's the last element. What if it was size minus two or size minus some other? Right, what if I removed index size minus two, size minus three? As long as the thing you're subtracting has nothing to do with n, then the amount of elements you're shifting is a constant amount of elements, so it isn't related to n, so it's constant. So, I mean, I, I know I could get really fiendish with these questions and ask you something really subtle, but I basically want you to know at the end it's fast and anywhere else it's slow. So I'm not going to nickel and dime you about it being 37 elements from the end likely, but you know, if I ask you that. <clears throat> um, okay, the second blob of code underneath the horizontal line here. I make a vector, n times I insert the value i, and then I clear it. How long does insert take to do once? What is the big O of that? N. I'm repeating it n times. What's the big O of a piece of code? Well, there's two insert calls, so does that make it into the third? Or what does that do? What do you think? I heard some people say n squared. Uh, what do you think is going on? Yeah. I think it, it's still n squared because you only have like one layer of it being mistake. Yeah, I mean, just look at it this way. Those insert calls each take about n. So it's like n plus n. So it's like the body of the loop is like 2n, probably, right? So then if I do that n times, it's like 2n times n. So it's 2n squared, right? 2n squared is n squared. Big o of n, right? So, so yeah, so this one is, uh, the bottom one is big O of n squared. Do one more? Here's a set. You would say, well, what's going on with a set? I don't remember a set. Well, I mean, you might have to look at your big O. Hold on, but I'll come back to the slide for a second. I have to jump away for a second. Um, we learn about sets and maps. A set has a big O of log for most of its key operations. Add, remove, uh, contains. A hash set has big O of one for most of its common operations. Add, contains, remove. Okay, well, if you have trouble memorizing that, don't worry, it's on your cheat sheet, it's on your syntax handout, it's okay. So if I know that that's true, I mean, I, I've had some students ask me like, well, why is that log of n? Uh, and the short answer is, we are gonna learn in detail how these two collections are implemented, and then you will know directly why it's big O of log n. It has to do with repeatedly slicing the data in half and smaller and smaller chunks until you find what you're searching for. I will show you how to do that soon. But for now, we just need to know that this is the runtime of these operations. If we know that, and then we go back to this big O question that we were talking about, then we're here. If I have a set, I've got two for loops, and then I call add. So how long does set.add take if you do it once? One call on set.add, what's the big O? Minus Log n, and it's nested in those two for loops. So what's the overall big O of this piece of code? Let me hear you. Yeah? You think it's just log n? No, I mean for the whole piece of code. Until the line. Just log n? No, I mean for the whole thing. On the loops and everything. Even both for both for loops and the set that I Why do you why do you think it's log n? For loops aren't based on that. The for loops are not looping up to n. Or anything that is related to n. So this is me trying to trick you a little bit, right? This is like log n times a million or something. Million, million repetitions or whatever. But log n times a million is big O of log n because that million coefficient, even though it's big, it's not relevant, related to n, which is what we care about. How is set.add related to n and i and j are not related to n? How is set.add not related to n if i and j are not related to n? Yeah, I guess in that case, 
there's no variable length n even in this code, so it would be more like the size of the set would be the n for the context here. I agree with you. Without there being an n written here, it's not entirely clear what n we're even talking about. So yeah, I'd have to start with that. But you see, like, sometimes, like, I know that the sort of general understanding here is like, oh, if you have loops, that becomes n, another loop inside there becomes n squared, I got it. And so then I throw you a loop that doesn't have to do with n to try to trick you. So just if you're looping up to some constant or if you're looping up to something that isn't there, like if I made a variable called awesome and I set awesome to a thousand and then I loop from zero to awesome, that has nothing to do with n. So it's in the thing. A couple of things are okay. Since the set starts up empty, doesn't this code always take a constant amount of time to run? Since the code starts up empty, doesn't it take a constant amount of time to run? Yeah, I guess that's true. Like you, there's, I, it was kind of related to your question, which is like there's no n here really. Uh, this is a kind of a weird piece of code. I threw this together because I just wanted to point out that like it's this code is big O of the log of the set size. But it's not, there's no literal n here like a variable called. So I mean I agree with you that like there's no variable I can change to see the runtime change here. I would have to change the loop bounds directly. Um, was there, there were two other things? Yeah. So just to be clear, this would be n, n squared log n because you have like the it's less than or equal to i plus nine 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 nine. But that like because it's less than or equal to i, I'm just adding the i. So well, if those loops were up to n or some multiple of n, if both of those four loops were up to n, then the code would be n squared log n. But because, it would, there's, but because there's only i's, like i's. Because there's only i's that are going up to a constant maximum and j's that are going up to that similar constant maximum, those aren't kind of new and so those are not part of the one time calculation. Can n vary? Well, I mean, n is some yeah. number. Sure, sure. If i goes up to n, but n is really small, then the code won't take very long. But the whole point of big O is like, what if n grows really, really big? What will happen? That's the whole intuition we're trying to talk about. Um, this last one. Last one, and then we'll move on. Um, if we have a hash map and a vector, and n times I put something in the hash map, and I insert something in the vector, and then I loop until the vector is empty, and I delete uh, elements out of the vector, that one's pretty tough. A lot going on in that one. Why don't we look at each loop at a time? The first for loop repeats times n. Inside the loop, it does hash map dot put. How long does it take to add and remove things from our hash collection a single time? One. How long does it take to insert at the start of a vector a single time? At the start of a vector, insert takes n. So it's kind of like one plus n, right, in the body of the loop. And the one sort of goes away because the n is so much bigger than the one. So just kind of ignore it. The hash map is a bit of a red herring in this problem. It doesn't really matter. So really, I'm doing n insertions at the start, which means that overall loop is big O of n squared. And then I loop until it's empty, removing from the start. How many repetitions will that loop have? How many repetitions of the loop? How many passes? n passes. Each pass does an operation that's big O is. So how long does that while loop take? So it's n squared followed by n squared. Overall answer is n squared. See, if this is on the test, you guys will be ready now, I know. Um, one more question, yeah. Question was, if this were just a regular map, those methods have a log runtime. So if I did put in here, now this would be like log plus n, log n plus n. So now what do you do? Well, log is still smaller than regular n. It's a lot smaller, actually. So we just ignore it. If it's, if it's additive, if it's multiplicative, log n times n, then it's n log n. But if it's additive like this, sequential like this, then the biggest one swallows the smaller ones. Uh, in the back, yeah. What if you had an if-else? An if-else? Yeah, basically, I mean, if else's are, I, I don't, I'm not going to try to trick you too much with if else's because, like, if else's just take the runtime of whichever branch it goes in. So, you know, if I do something like, you know, if i mod 2 is 0, then do the map one, else do the vector one, or something like whatever, right? So now half the time it's doing the map thing, and half the time it's doing the vector thing. 
So it's like half n squared zing and half n log ending, and it's that it, it'll come out the same basic. I don't know. So it just takes the runtime of whichever one that it goes into. So yeah. How come it's O of n I'm inserting into the same position zero every time? Because in order to insert there, I have to slide all the other elements over so I can fit it in. So it doesn't replace what was at index zero. It moves over everyone else to, to free up index zero. If I said dot set, vector dot set zero to be this value, that just modifies in place. That would take a constant time each call. Yeah. Yo. Um, So like if this call of this test was taking a long time, then yeah, every pass through the loop, it would have to do the test again, test again, test again. So you'd have to think about that in your runtime calculations. I'm probably not going to make you do that because that's trickier, trickier than I've shown you on the example problems. But um, yeah, I mean, that is you know, the test. The time it takes to do the test of a loop is part of the runtime of the loop. Mostly the tests we run are usually quickie things like is i less than n? Is this vector empty? Is the stack empty? That kind of stuff. I feel like you guys want another secret tip for people only in the room, right? Uh, okay. And that's how I met my wife. <clears throat> okay, so. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> I know this is like, this is the worst swerve ever, but I want to talk about some new stuff for a few minutes. And I know that's not where your head is at right now, but that's something I got to do. If that's, not up, if that's not what you're up for, then I don't know. I can't force you, but wait, what is this? I don't want this. Where am I? No, I don't, I don't want this document. I want a different one. Uh, so look. I want to tell you where we're going next, what our next unit material is going to be about. It's about a collection called binary trees. It's not entirely unrelated to the other stuff we were just talking about because it has to do with how could you efficiently implement a set. We were just talking about those set methods, those hash set, hash map methods. How come some of them are log in? Some of them are even constant time. That's kind of interesting. How is it that we can implement these things so efficiently? We learned a lot about linked lists and arrays and how could you implement a vector? How could you implement a stack and queue? This kind of stuff. So this is a trick I'm going to teach you going forward that is used to implement a set. So a tree is a structure made out of nodes. And in general, it's like a linked list, except each node has more than one next pointer. And most commonly, we would talk about binary trees, where each node has two next pointers. And we don't really call them next. We don't draw the thing going sideways with two next. Instead, we draw it vertically going down where we would say the node has a left pointer and a right pointer. Uh, it's, it looks a little bit like a tree, except it's upside down, I guess. That's how we draw them. And um, <clears throat> there's certain properties a tree has to have, like, for example, the, the links on a tree are directed. But that's true of a linked list as well. You go from yourself to the next. You can't go from the next backward. Um, also, a tree has to be what's called asynchronous, which means there aren't any loops back up to the top, or like from this node, I can't get back up to the top again necessarily, or something like that. Root nodes, you can describe root nodes with a recursive definition. Either a tree is empty, or it's a node that has a tree and a tree underneath it. And it's not a coincidence that, uh, <laughs> that you could describe this structure recursively, because basically, from your guy's perspective, trees are <laughs> The mixture of pointers and recursion. Doesn't that sound awesome? It's like the two things you enjoy the most in this course put together. Uh, th th that's what I choose to believe. <laughs> that's how I choose to think that you feel about this. Um, so that's what a tree is. And again, a tree will be something we will use to implement sets. The rough idea will be you'll store smaller things to the left and larger things to the right. And when you're searching for things, you'll go left, right, left, right to find them based on whether you need to get bigger or smaller. And that will enable you to quickly find target element values in a set. That's kind of the idea we're going to build toward. 
There's lots of things people do with trees in computer science. You can store family trees, you can store directory trees, you can store letter trees for words you type in on your phone and auto-completes. That's basically a tree looking at all the words that start with those letters and suggesting ones that could be, could be what you're typing. Um, if you're writing a compiler or a programming language, you write uh, trees to process expressions, this times this plus this minus that. That's kind of a tree of operators and operands. Um, all kinds of different things like that. It's heavily used in artificial intelligence, trees of decisions, things your algorithm needs to do or think about. So trees are all, all over the place. They're super duper common. Uh, and just practical uh, consideration is that a lot of interview, job interview questions for internships and stuff, they love asking binary tree coding questions. Because if you can do this, you just prove to them that you can do pointers and that you can do recursion. So then they should hire you, basically. So this is a topic you probably want to get awesome at from this course. Uh, I've got a question here, like which, are, which of these are valid and which of these are invalid? Can you tell me like one of these trees that is not valid? Just somebody raise your hand. Like which one of these wouldn't be a legal binary tree? Yeah, what do you say? Number five. Number five. What's wrong with it? Uh, it's not a cyclic or whatever. Not a cyclic. Yeah, it goes back to the start. It goes back to the to top. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Any other illegal trees? Yeah? That's seven. Seven. Yeah, um, I don't know if my previous words made it very clear, but you're right that you're not supposed to have two parents that get you to the same child node, basically. Um, you know, I, I think on my last slide I said that you can use binary trees and stuff to, to represent families, although that doesn't work super well if, if the examples we're doing because you can't have two parents point to one child necessarily, but that's okay. Um, yeah, so that one's not valid. Any other invalid ones? Eight, yeah, eight has two ways to get to that one node there. Yeah, that's kind of the idea. Okay. Well, here's some terminology. Let's throw a bunch of terms at you. Every little element of the tree is a node, but that's the same term we use when we talk about linked lists. We have a sort of start node. Uh, in a linked list, you call the start the front. And with a binary tree, we call it the root. We have a lot of like tree terms here, you know. The start of the binary tree is the root. <coughs> and um, the nodes underneath it, the, the collections of nodes underneath the root are called subtrees. You have a left subtree and a right subtree. That's all the nodes underneath you on those sides. You have what are called roots, or sorry, uh, what are called leaf nodes. Leaf nodes are the ones at the bottom, the ones that don't have any children. Not all the leaf nodes have to be at the same place as each other. Like six could have children, and then six wouldn't be a leaf, but six as children would be. So the children, the leaves would be four, five, whatever, and then seven. You know? um, we talk about how many levels up and down the tree you are. The root is at the first level, and the children of the root are at the second level. The overall number of levels in a tree is called the height of a tree. Height is interesting because I just talked about how you implement a tree using a set. And you sort of go down, 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 down the tree until you find the thing that you're searching for. So the height of a tree has a lot to do with the runtime of various algorithms that process a tree. But you know, we come back to that later, I guess. Anyway, lots of terms. I'll just start using these terms. If, you, if I'm using a term that you don't remember, just, just yell at me. I'll, I'll remind you what it means. Um, <clears throat> So you can implement trees using C++ objects and structures. So we're going to write a little structure called a tree node that stores a piece of data and a pointer to the left and a pointer to the right. Just like we had a little list node that stored a piece of data and a pointer to the next node. Same idea. Um, you can store any kind of data that you want. But for starters, I always like to start with ints because I think ints are the sort of simplest type to store. OK. So here's a tree node structure. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. It's just a tree node with a data and a left and a right pointer. You can construct one and you can ask if it's a leaf or not. Um, the leaf means the left and the right are both null. So it's just like a structure with some methods inside of it. Mostly when I've shown you methods, they've been in classes, but structs can have methods too. So that's all, data left and right. That's all this thing has. So if you want to use this to build a tree, here's kind of how that looks. Oops, what am I doing? Not this. Uh, why do I have all these old files open? Wait, I don't want this. Do not save. Wait. Uh oh. Hold on. 6B lectures. Binary tree. Okay. I don't know what happened there. So here's kind of if you wanted to build that tree that I crudely drew in my ASCII art there, you'd say the root stores nine, roots left child stores six. Roots right child stores 14, and then the left left is negative 3, and the left right is, you know, can you kind of see how these lines basically build that picture, right? Uh, I didn't have anything where I said null here, because the constructor of a tree node sets the children to be null automatically until you change them. So those bottom four nodes, uh, 
negative three across to 19. They all have null children, they're leaves, okay? So, you know, like if I, if I said uh, root, root right, left, right equals a neutrino of 88. So root right, left, right would be at 88. So that would be down here, you know what I mean? So I'll just, something expensive, great. Is, is my wife sending me Valentine request messages remotely? What is this? <laughs> Buy me something expensive, dear. Uh, uh, I think that would be here. So that would be like an 88 right there, right? Okay, I have a question. So can you only have two branches on one, or would that be like a middle? Oh, can you have a left and a middle, or can you have three branches? So sure, I mean, you can do pretty much anything you want. Um, what we're going to study mostly going forward is trees that have two children, called binary tree. Um, if you had three, that would be called like a ternary tree. You could have four quaternary tree. You could have any number of children. But I think a lot of the concepts generalize. If you can do it with two, it, you could do it with three. You can do it with four. Um, so what you'll see is that like most of the neat, like I, I don't know if I've, I mean, I showed you a slide of like reasons why people use trees or whatever back here. and. Here, and I also said we're going to use it to implement sets and stuff. And I guess what I'm trying to say about that is if you have the ability to split in two, that's very powerful. And then from there, adding the ability to split into three doesn't add very much power. So I think the benefit I'm trying to get at will be fine with two children. Although it's legal, it's possible to do more if you need to. Um, anyway, so that, there's a tree, right? So I made a tree. This looks a lot like our code that was making list nodes, link lists last, last week, you know? Okay, well, uh, where am I? Uh, here. So imagine I have those nodes that I put on the last slide. And I want to write a function that prints out the whole tree. Prints out the tree. Just one element per line, so it prints, I don't know, it does, I don't even care what order. I don't care the order. Print any order you want. Well, I guess it prints 29, 41, 6, 17, 81, 9, 40. Um, now here's the thing, if we have to write that code, I said here, accept the tree pointer as a parameter. So you, you know, we did that with linked list. We accept the front of the linked list as a parameter. So that should feel pretty similar to that, right? So okay, let's go over here. Uh, I want to write a function called print. So you pass root, right? Okay, so let's go in there. I mean, it's empty. We haven't written it yet. So remind me again, what do we do when we print a linked list? How do you, how do you like, walk around in the elements and look at them all. What do you do? Yes? Yeah, you made like a temp or current pointer and you said while not null, go to the next, go to the next, go to the next. So that seems like that might be a good approach to do here, right? So maybe you say tree node current equals node and then while current isn't null pointer, uh, and then instead of current equals current dot next, would you do left? Would you do right? Suddenly, I hope you're seeing that this is a little bit trickier because you sort of need to go left and you need to go right. In the linked list, it's simple because it's linear. There's just one next node to go to. But now we have to go to like two other places. So how do I make the loop go? Do I now make current one and current? Do I split it apart into two current pointers? And then those have two children, so now I have to split into four current pointers? Do you see how this is trickier than just printing out a linked list, right? Well, I told you something earlier that you might remember now. I said that trees are about mixing pointers with recursion. So this is where it gets horrible. <laughs> uh, the better way to print a tree is not while loops. It's recursively. So how does recursion help us solve this? Well, let's go back to all that stuff we learned to death in recursion. Is it base case? Yeah, we'll get there. Give me a second. Go, easy turbo. We're going to get to base case. But how is printing a tree similar to printing other trees? If, I, if you get that pointer to that tree, how is printing that tree similar to printing something else? You have a, a the tree is basically just the, the, the branches, the, the children of the roots are just like smaller trees. The children of the root are trees. The subtrees are trees. That is very self-similar, right? That's recursion. That's what that is. 
So, I mean, the other way I love to think about recursion is like, what if I had a magical function that could print all the other nodes except for me, and all I had to do was print myself? Like, if I'm a node, you know? Um, if I had a function like that, this problem would be really easy. Because what I would do would be, I would say, well, let's see, I have a magical function, so I would do C out my node's data, endl, and then I'd call the magic function, and I'd pass my left, and I'd call the magic function, and I'd pass my right. So the magical function will print all those other guys, and I'll print myself. That would be great if we had a magical function, right? But of course, you guys have seen this trick enough times. The magic function is me. I'm the magic function, right? <laughs> the power is yours. If I just blew your mind, you should go study some more. Because <laughs> we've done recursion before. But hey, what am I missing? I, I reached you. I, I taught you something. That was great. At least four people answered. Um, what is a base case for this? What is a tree? that is easy to print? Yeah? A leaf? a leaf? That sounds great, okay. So a leaf is a node that doesn't have any children. So I guess basically you don't want me to go to the left if the left is null, right? So like if node left isn't null, then print the left. Because I don't want to be calling that line on null nodes, right? If I go too far, it would crash my program. Okay, sure. And then if the right isn't null, then print the right. Let's see if it works. Now, just for reference, um, down here, this is the tree that we have. Oh, God, I didn't compile it before class. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm going to lose five minutes for that. Oh, man. <clears throat> I never thought I'd see the day when my students would say, how come my C++ is so much slower than my Java? <laughs> I'm like, man, it's, it's upside down. Uh, we're in the upside down uh, from Stranger Things when people are saying that. Um, never mind. Uh, so that's the tree. And, well, it crashed, but hold on a sec. 9, 6, negative 3, 7, 14, 11. Hey, it printed all the nodes, right? We did it. You guys are so smart. You're going to rock this test. I know it. Um, I think we could do a little bit better because... I really think the, the lesson I really wanted you to learn about recursion was that you should be as lazy as you possibly can. Um, it has to do with this concept called uh, arm's length recursion or sort of recursive zen, like finding the truest base case. Is there a note of a tree that's easier to print than a leaf? No. no. If a node is null, what do you do? Just don't print anything, right? So look, let me, let me morph this code for you. And, and I, I'm going to try to make the point about this. This code is OK. It works. It does work. I guess it has a small bug that if the overall root of the tree is null, it crashes because it tries to print the data of the null root. But that's OK. That's, that's OK. Um, but what I really want you to understand is that this code is arm's length recursion, and it's not the best way to do this. And this is going to come up over and over and over when we talk about binary trees. You should always think about the null case first. So what you should really say is, well, if the node that's being passed in is null pointer, then it's you know empty, null, node, nothing to do. You shouldn't print anything if the tree's null. But otherwise, I should print its data and its left and its right, just like that. Okay? But I don't need these tests anymore. Because if the left is null, it'll just call in and do this. If the right is null, same thing. So I can just say that. And actually, if you don't mind, I'd rather, I don't like empty branches of if else. So why don't I just say if the node isn't null, print it, print its left, print its right. That code is better. I like that better than the other one. Because the other one had two ifs, and this one only needs one if. That's part of it. Another part of it is I think a good attribute of recursive code is that you're focusing on your thing and not on the next guy's thing. Don't worry about whether the next guy's null or whether the left is null or whether the right. Worry about whether you are null. <laughs> Focus on you. Now, if you can't quite see that this is still going to work, first of all, I'll run it so you don't think I'm crazy. 
So it did print the tree with all the different elements inside. So it works, first of all. But again, like if you know that your node is not null, print your data, then go ahead and recursively print your left, which might be null, in which case it'll immediately exit, or it might not be null, in which case it'll print a bunch of things, and then do the same thing for the right. Most of the binary tree functions that we write will have an elegant Zen solution like this, and they'll have a bulky full of ifs and else's and if and more else's solution that's arm's length recursion. So my goal for you guys is to pull you more towards the elegant solutions. I think that especially matters with, with binary trees. Um, I've just got a minute or two left, so let's do one more thing. How would I calculate the size, the number of nodes in a tree? And let me remind you, Everything you do with trees is recursive. <laughs> so if that is my tree and I want to know how many nodes are in it, how would I count that up? Do you have any suggestions? What is the self-similarity here? I have a magic function that helps me with most of the work. You know what I mean? What's the general um, relationship, self-similar relationship here? Yeah? Just do a similar thing as the print function? Well, I'll tell you what, I, I, you know, I don't want to like copy that code necessarily, but I do think we could think about different kinds of trees. Um, you know, I think there's still this kind of self-similarity of like you and then your children and how do their size relate to each other. Like if I told you that I already knew that the size of this subtree was three, somehow I magically know that. Somehow I magically know that the size of this subtree is four. So I know three and four and I ask you, what's your size? What's your size? three and four, and you're above them, so what's the total? Three plus four plus one for you, right? So really the size of a tree is return one plus size of node left plus size of node right. What have we forgotten? Base case, what's the easiest tree to know the size of? If the node is null, what's the size of a null tree? Zero. Zero. No, one would be a leaf. If it's empty, it's nothing. Otherwise, it's one plus the size of the children. If the children are null, they're zeros and they don't contribute to the total. So that's how these functions usually look. I got to stop there. Good luck with the rest of your studying. You guys got this. I'll see you tomorrow night.